Suppose I asked you to add up all the integers from 1 to n. Normally you might think of this process iteratively. You'd start with 1, and then you'd add 2, and then 3, and so on until you reached n. And here's how you might express that uh, as, as, as a function. Sum of n is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot 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 until you get to n, where n is greater than or equal to 1. Now Java's looping constructs make doing this pretty easy. But there is a totally different way to look at the problem, which may at first seem a little bit strange. It looks like this. The sum of 1 is 1. And the sum of n, where n is greater than 1, is that number plus the sum of 1 less than that number. Now when you look at this, at first it probably looks like it's a sort of circular definition. But if you look a little closer, it doesn't. Take a look at what happens when we apply this definition to the problem of calculating the sum of 4. Okay, the sum of 4 is the same as 4 plus the sum of 3. We've applied the recursive case. Well, then we have to take care of the sum of 3, but that's really just the same as 3 plus the sum of 2. So we apply the recursive case again. We do it once more with the, the sum of 2. Uh, we get 2 plus the sum of 1. And we do it finally with that sum of 1. Now we've hit our base case, or, or the case that stops this call from happening again. Uh, when we resolve all of those, we end up with a final answer of 10. In other words, this is not actually circular because we have a base case that stops us from infinitely continuing along this process. Whenever we have a function that we define in terms of itself the way we've done here, we call it a recursive function. Here's another example where we have this option. Right? If we're trying to define factorial, well of course we could define it iteratively, 1 times 2 times 3 times and so on until we get to n, that's how we get the factorial of n, or we could define it recursively. The factorial of 1 is 1, and the factorial of n, some other number, is that number, n, times the factorial of the number immediately below it. Now, surely the iterative solution here is more familiar to us. So that's, that's what we've been taught first. That's our first instinct. But that's not always the case. It's not always true. If you recall the definition of the Fibonacci numbers that we've, uh, we've talked about before, the way it works is the first two elements of the Fibonacci sequence, 1 and 1, are predefined. And after that, any Fibonacci number is just the sum of its two immediate predecessors. So in this case, you know, 3 is the sum of 2 and 1. 5 is the sum of 3 and 2. This lends itself really, really naturally to a recursive definition. You can see it here. Fibonacci of 1 is 1. Fibonacci of 2 is 1. And after that, Fibonacci of n is just the Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus the Fibonacci of n minus 2. The first predecessor plus the second predecessor. It's actually a little bit of a hassle to try to write a non-recursive version of the Fibonacci method. And again, note here, we have those two key pieces that we like to see. We have a recursive case. In this case, it's this third element right here. And we also have a base case. In this case, we have two base cases. Those stop us from having a circular definition. Now, if we have a recursive definition of some process, it's actually pretty easy to write a recursive method that implements it. Now here, when we say a recursive method, really what we just mean is a method that calls itself. So start with a method that computes factorials. Here we can see the return type of factorial is int, takes a single parameter, n, and we're saying, here's our base case, if n equals one, immediately return one, and we have our recursive case, otherwise return n times the factorial of n minus one. Maybe a comparison is helpful. Here's the factorial iterative version. You can see it's a little bit longer, and it's not as if it's actually easier to understand than the recursive version. Take a look for yourself if you'd like. As another example, here's an implementation of Fibonacci. You have the recursive implementation on top and the iterative version on the bottom. You can see the recursive version is a really beautiful definition. It's just so clean and lovely. The iterative version is a little clunkier. It's a bit longer. It's, it's not as nice. Hopefully you can see that the, the iterative version here is just not as elegant a solution as the recursive version. We're going to be able to understand recursion a little bit better if we trace the sequence of recursive calls and returns that occur in a normal situation. So suppose we want to calculate the factorial of 4. We're going to call fact of 4, which in turn is going to call fact of 3, which in turn is going to call fact of 2, which in turn is going to call fact of 1, and fact of 1 returns 1 to factorial 2. So we go back there, and now factorial 2 returns 2 to factorial 3, which returns factorial 6 to factorial 4, which returns 24. And that's what we have in this runtime trace that you see here. At first, maybe it seems a little strange to have all these calls to the factorial method 
in sort of a suspended state as they wait for the calls further down the line or higher up on the stack to finish running. I guess the key thing to understand is any method call does its work and returns its value to its predecessor, right? to the method that called it. And that goes on all the way up the line. And eventually we get back to the original method call, which finishes the job. Now, the same way that you have to protect yourself from writing infinite loops, you have to make sure that you don't end up in infinite recursion as well. You got to have a well-defined base case, a stopping case. For the factorial method, this is the case of n equals 1. In that case, we know we, we've stopped, we return 1. That's our base case here. And if you're looking at your recursive case, you have to make sure that the recursive case approaches the base case. In other words, we have to make sure we, we eventually reach the base case. Here we can see that in our recursive call factorial of n minus 1, factorial assuming that our precondition holds true and it starts as something greater than or equal to 1, we know it's eventually going to decrease to 1 over the course of multiple recursive calls. But had we made a mistake and accidentally written uh, as our factorial recursive case, return n times factorial n plus 1, as you can see in this gray box, we'd end up with an infinite recursion because we wouldn't be approaching our base case of n equals 1. And in this case, we'd get a stack overflow error. Here you can see another example of a broken recursive method. This method works just fine if n is odd, if the parameter is odd, but when the parameter is even, when n is even, the method is going to run straight through the base case and keep going. It ends up looking like this. If we start with a, a call of 4, it goes through 2 and 0, and then negative 2, negative 4, negative 6. We never hit the base case of n equals 1. So this is a case where we were approaching the base case, but we blew right past it. We've spoken before about the stack, but let's revisit it a little bit now. Whenever you start a program, you create what we call a call stack. And when a method is called, we create what we call an activation record on the top of the call stack. Every activation record for a method has a bunch of things, but some of the most important things are it has space for any parameters that we pass to the method. It's got uh, space for all the local variables that the method's going to use, and it has the space for the value that's going to get returned by the method. And then finally, when that method returns, its activation record gets wiped completely clean from the top of the stack. Now let's look at a little example of how this would work with a recursive method. For the sake of simplicity, we're going to ignore everything about the activation record, everything about the stack frame, except for the parameters and the return value of the factorial method. It's got one of each. One parameter, one return value. That's all we're going to look at. So every activation record for this method is going to have sort of a cell for the value of the parameter n and for the return value of factorial. Now suppose we call factorial of 4. Here what we're looking at is a trace of the call stack during calls to factorial all the way until we get down to factorial 1. You can see we start with our call to factorial of 4, which eventually leads to a call of factorial 3, factorial 2, and factorial 1, and now the recursion starts to unwind. The return value from each cell gets multiplied by the parameter n in the record below it. And then the top record gets removed. So you can see what that happening here. Factorial of 1, we end up returning 1. That gets multiplied by 2 by the parameter, we end up with 2. That gets multiplied by 3, the parameter here, we end up with 6. And notice all of the prior activation records, all the prior stack frames have been wiped clean. Finally, 6 gets multiplied by 4, the parameter here. And our first activation record, factorial of 4, returns itself 24. Not bad. Now, the question still remains, when you would choose to use recursion. Typically, if you can have an iterative solution, you can also probably have a recursive solution and vice versa. But choosing which one you want to use arbitrarily is kind of pointless and it's often really hard to do. One thing people often say is that, you know, a method repeatedly calling itself, the method call and there's a return statement and all the overhead of running a method, that often takes longer, it takes more CPU time than actually writing a loop that just does the solution iteratively. Now that's sometimes true, but it's not always the problem that it's made out to be. For our purposes as sort of beginning programmers, we shouldn't really be all too concerned about squeezing every last byte of data uh, out of a computer, every last bit of efficiency. 
our overarching goal should really just be to learn to think about these problems uh, in, in interesting ways. And sometimes that means an iterative solution. Sometimes that means a recursive solution. These are really important fundamental ideas uh, that, that are really valuable additions to our problem solving toolkit. So we'll finish today by talking about just uh, two, two problems that are very nicely solved with recursion. The first is the Towers of Hanoi. Now, they say that many centuries ago in the city of Hanoi, uh, the monks in a particular monastery were continually engaged in what now seems to be a strange thing to do. They had 64 rings of increasing size, and they'd been placed on a vertical wooden peg. You can see a picture of it here. Now, beside it were two other pegs, and the monks were trying to move all the rings from the first peg to the third peg, but they had two constraints. The first was you could only move one ring at a time, and the second was a ring could be moved to any peg, but it could not be placed on top of a smaller ring. So again, move one ring at a time, and you can never put a larger ring on top of a smaller ring. Now, the monks believed that the world would end and humankind would be freed from suffering when they finally finished this task. So suppose we owe these monks a bit of a debt of gratitude for not finishing the task. But we can't really fault them for not finishing because it turns out solving this problem takes on the order of 2 to the n minus 1 moves, which for 64 rings on one move per second, that turns out to be 600 billion years. Now, fortunately, with modern processing power, this problem is much, much more manageable, and we'll take a look at a recursive solution to this program. We'll use a recursive method called move. Now, the first time this method is called, we ask it to move all n rings from peg 1 to peg 3. So then that method goes on to call itself to move the top n minus 1 rings to peg 2, and then moves the largest ring, which it didn't move, it moves it from peg 1 to peg 3. And then finally, it calls itself one more time to move all of those n minus 1 rings that are currently on peg 2, to move them to peg 3. We can see the code on the next slide. Now this is a little bit small to look at on the screen, but we can see we have our recursive method move, which calls itself. And we have the three elements of the solution. Move all but one of the pegs to the empty peg, move one peg, move all but one of the pegs to a placeholder peg, move the largest remaining peg to peg three, and then finally go ahead and do the same thing, except now our placeholder pegs have switched. Take a little bit to read through this code. I suggest you Google maybe some uh, some some animations of the Towers of Hanoi solution. Uh, walk through this code. Run it with some small n just to confirm in your mind that it, that it works. Again, ideally, maybe with a smaller number, something less than 10. Large values of n, something like 64, actually still take a long time, and they could tie up your computer for a while. Now, as a second example of a nicely recursive problem, we'll talk about the eight queens problem. The goal is to place eight queens on a chessboard such that none of the queens threaten each other. If you recall from chess, a queen can attack any other piece that's in the same row or the same column or the same diagonal. So you can have at most a single queen in each row, column, and diagonal of the board. Now, it's not obvious that there is a solution, but here we can see one. If you pause the video and pick through it, you can see that none of these queens threaten any of the other queens. Now we'll take a look at a program that solves this problem, or at least attempts to, and we'll call it the Many Queens program. It's going to try to place n queens safely on some n by n board. And it's either going to print a solution, or it's going to print a message that tells us that there is no solution. At the heart of it is a method called canPlaceQueen. Initially, the board is going to start out empty. And the first time we call this method, it's just going to place a queen right at the top of the very first column. Then it calls itself to try to place a queen in the very first safe spot in column two, and then again at the first spot of column three, and then again at the first safe spot of column four, and so on. Until finally it calls itself to place a queen in the very first safe spot of the last column. Now if we get to some step, let's say it's column five, and the method fails, then it returns, and we 
resume processing the previous column, in this case it would be column four, by looking at the next possible safe square. And if there is one, then the process moves onward to column five again, or else it moves back to column three, and we, we try that. And it just does that until it gets to a solution or until we fail completely. Either we find a solution or all the possibilities are totally exhausted. You'll also see when you take a look through the code that there's a method called attacked. And this method just determines if a queen that is in row R and column C is threatened by any of the other queens that are already placed on the board. We can go through a quick illustration of the algorithm. Uh, you can see right now we're starting fresh, no queens on the board. We start at position one. Great, I'll go on. The first safe spot, well, this cell was attacked, so is this one. This is the first safe one, uh, so we'll go on to the next column. Looks like that was the first safe spot in this column. We'll go on to the next one. Uh, looks like the second spot was the first safe one in the fourth column. Uh, the, okay, we got the fourth one, first safe spot here. When we get to this column, there are no safe spots. So we've got to go back and we move on to the next possible safe spot, which turns out to be in the very last row here. We'll go on. Now there is a safe spot in this column, but we get here and there is no safe spot again. So we go back. Try the next safe spot, but there is none. So we've got to go back again. Well, there's no more spots here we can try, so we've got to go back again. And we'll try another safe spot here, the next possible safe one. Yep. Uh-oh, looks like we got to go back. Go back, go back. Next spot. Oh, we got to go back again. And looks like we're going to have to go back again. Next safe spot. Oh, got to go back again, but there's nothing left. Come back here. Next safe spot. Okay. Oh, nothing left. Nothing left. Nothing left. Nothing left. Last row here. Nothing left. Nothing left. Nothing left. Okay, we're back here. Nothing left. Nothing left. Nothing left. Nothing left. Nothing left. Nothing left. And now we're back. Still haven't found anything. It's going to go on like this. If we continue, ultimately we would arrive at this solution. And, you, and in fact, if you run this program with a board size of 8, you'll likely get this solution in the end. That's it for today. Big takeaways for the day. Make sure you can tell me what the two parts of any recursive method are. And uh, be sure that you can trace through a recursive call like these two. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of energy practicing writing little recursive methods and getting comfortable thinking about how we can take a large problem and break it down into a smaller version of itself, which is something recursion is just very, very powerful for.